Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture, where the lines of fact and fiction are blurred by dog face filters. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging. You picked a great time to hit the old download button because we have a special Christmas treat for you. The one and only John Crowley is in the house, but that's not all. Perhaps America's finest modern-day occultist, John Michael Greer, also joins us. You may remember John Michael Greer from episode 52 not so long ago. He's an author and blogger whose work focuses on the overlaps between ecology, spirituality, and the future of industrial society. He served 12 years as the Grand Arch Druid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America and currently heads the Druidical Order of the Golden Dawn. John Crowley, of course, is the author of the World Fantasy Award-winning Little Big, the four-volume Egypt Cycle, and last year's The Chemical Wedding by Christian Rosenkreutz. John's latest novel is Ka Dar Oakley in the Ruin of Emmer, released October 24th by Saga Press. Ka has been named a Los Angeles Times Best Book of 2017. They actually called it in their review a beautiful, often dreamlike masterpiece, and it is the basis for our chat here today. But it's not even close to all that we talk about. It turns out both Johns, Crowley and Greer, share a common vision of the future, one that we will share with you here today. All in all, it's a compelling, thought-provoking dialogue with two of my favorite people to read and hear. But don't take my word for it. Sit back with a spiked eggnog and a Christmas mushroom or two and see for yourself. Enjoy! Hello? Hey, John. It's Ryan. How are you? Yeah, doing okay. Yourself? Doing well, doing well. Hey, thanks so much for the flexibility this morning. Oh, not a problem. Hello? John. Yes, hello. Hey, it's Ryan. Thanks so much for <laughs> hopping on Skype here with me. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a mysterious process to me. I almost never use it, and I always get it wrong, but here yeah. I am. All right, oh, I have a uh, co-host with me for the day. His name is John Michael Greer. I sent you his bio in the email. I just wanted you guys to introduce yourselves to each other. John Michael, could you maybe just tell John a, a little bit about yourself before we get going here? Okay. The the really short form is that I'm a I'm a writer in mostly in the in nonfiction, largely in the fields of hermeticism and and the Western esoteric tradition. As as I hope Ryan lets you know, I'm I'm waiting for the for the imminent publication of a translation of Giordano Bruno's On the Shadows of the Ideas. Oh, which, yes. Um, yeah, and yes. he's, now and he's I, my, but that's that's basically me. We certainly have something in common. Then I remember now. I remember your your uh, note about the Bruno translation. Yes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. interesting. Sweet. I look forward and, to it. You didn't by any chance do a uh, do a translation earlier of another Bruno text, did you? Um, no. This is the first piece of Bruno that I've done. Good. Then I can so. tell you the last the last translation I got of a Bruno text was awful. So <laughs> that doesn't surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember which one it was? Uh, it was one of the late Latin poems uh, oh dear. on the on the on the something and the all. I can't remember the name of the the Bruno text now. Oh, on the on yeah on the de, de, Princi, de Principio ad Uno. Yes. Right. Oh yes. dear. Yeah, on the, yeah. Uh, yes. De Principio yeah. ad Uno. Right. That's the one. Yeah. 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 And it was, oh dear. it was pretty bad. So I'm sure yours will be better. But hardly I, I, cer- <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> I hope that the guy who did that translation isn't listening. I'm not going to give his name. <laughs> I actually hope he is listening because he should know that. But uh, <laughs> So for the sake of my own sanity, John Crowley, I'm just going to call you John and JMG. I'm just going to sure. call you JMG. So it, that's if I totally wanna cool. address you guys separately, that's fine. Does. So Thanks, JMG, you did have maybe a question about hermeticism that I think we could just start with. Well, I, I think, first of all, I need to get my 30 seconds of, of utter fanboy geekdom out of the way, um, because I, I have been I have been a reader of our guests of fiction since the early 1980s, and I, I adore your fiction, basically. <laughs> I have a I have a copy of Ka half finished on the on the arm of the couch right now, which uh, is half finished because I've been reading it one scene at a time. You know, good bourbon, you don't go. So. <laughs> Right. So, setting aside the the obligatory thirty seconds of of um, gushing fanboy activity, I, I'm very curious the, because I mean, there's a lot of fiction out there that pretends to borrow esoteric and occult traditions. You have everything from the Harry Potter books on the one hand 
to um, Dan Brown doing things and this kind of stuff. And your work is among the very few that actually take uh, hermeticism seriously, if, if, you know, in a fictional, fictional context, and use the actual traditions to provide the magic that, that runs through your fantasy. And I'm very curious where that came from and how you got into that. Well, it's a fairly simple story, actually. It, was, it starts with a, a day I spent in the Brooklyn Public Library, one of the great New York City public libraries, because that was the closest public library I could take books out of. When I was living on the Lower East Side, I'd go over to Brooklyn and, and go into the library there. And I can't remember what I was looking for or why, but I came upon Francis Yates's book, The Art of Memory. Which I then read, and as you know, as a reader of my books, I draw enormously on all of hers. In fact, it, the first place it turns up is in my very first novel, The Deep. And I use mm-hmm. some pictures that I found in her book uh, for the cards that the sort of transgender seer in that book uh, uh-huh. uh, used. You know, I managed, yeah. I managed to miss that. <laughs> Well, that's where it started. And Francis and, and Yates's uh, Art of Memory, which just, just astonished me. It astonished me. Mm-hmm. I thought I was reading about people who had minds that just were didn't work the way I did. Either that or they were not telling the truth about what they claimed to be able to do with the art. <laughs> it didn't matter to me because I was just fascinated by it and instantly said, oh, this is, I'm, I have to use this in some way, somehow. I, had, I mean, I hadn't even written a novel yet. I was just mm-hmm. uh, kicking around. And, of course... The first book, The Art of Memory, later led to the second book, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. Mm-hmm. And now I have this body of knowledge that comes from Francis Yates. Now, you, I know, as a smart guy who does a lot of this kind of stuff, must know that Francis Yates's takes on both Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition are now a little bit, how should we put it, simplistic seeming and maybe mm-hmm. sometimes mistaken. But it doesn't matter because it gave me a way into that entire in, into that mm-hmm. entire mm-hmm. and I can't really describe to you uh, how how did I can't remember how I got into the, really the next big move that I felt I did in in occult traditions and that is into genuine Gnosticism mm-hmm. by Hans Jonas's book ah uh, okay yeah and that was there were stories in there that were just so moving to me the whole Sophia tradition. It, that he described was just so moving. It's the most moving religious story I've ever read. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> she falls out of the uh, the pleroma and falls down to earth, creating matter in the and by the by her tears and her sorrows. So yeah, that was and th- and that led me to kinds of other kinds of speculations. And I then I start, I connected that to readings because I was interested in the uh, southern occult tradition in effect, hillbilly occult tradition. Mm-hmm. I read mm-hmm. a, little, a little bit about it too, and that and to combine those two traditions, the Sophia mm-hmm. tradition and that hillbilly evangelical, puritanical kind of tradition. And the same was mm-hmm. one, of the, one of the most fun things I ever did in that <laughs> in that series of four books. Yeah. So that's 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 where I got that, it all. That that makes perfect sense. I actually um... Francis Yates's books were, were kind of my introduction to the actual historical hermetic tradition. And yeah, you know, she jumped to some conclusions. She she was the first person exploring it. So, yes, uh, right. Yes. Uh, she was the first person certainly to explore it in the context of English history and Giordano Bruno's connection mm-hmm. to all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And wherever she went wrong, and I finally got to the point where I could see her making mistakes. I mean, she, she uh, summarized the, the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz in mm-hmm. her book on the Rosicrucians and didn't describe it correctly. <laughs> it's True a, enough. For, for a great yeah. You know, I also put her in my book. She's in the last volume of Endless Things. She shows up, uh, she has a little, get her and her sister, who she lived with for many years, mm-hmm. show up, mm-hmm. a little, makes a little guest appearance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, managed, that, I managed to miss that also. The, yeah. Okay, Easter eggs. Got it. <laughs> Actually, it's an imaginary appearance of mm-hmm. an imaginary Francis Yates. <laughs> so it's <laughs> my usual games. Endless Things is the last volume of the Egypt cycle, right, John? Right. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I mentioned this to JMG uh, the last time we spoke uh, that you have, the last time that you and I spoke, John, you had just published your own. I guess, take on the chemical wedding. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? Because it's not something that we fleshed out too much, but what made you want to tackle it last year? Well, my introduction to the story is Frances Yates. And uh, she mentions it in a couple of places. 
and in her essays, but then she wrote a whole book on the Rosicrucian Revolution. She, uh, mm -hmm. That wasn't the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, is what she calls mm -hmm. it. And there she has a very detailed description of it, which I use in the Egypt books, especially in Endless Things, where it's quoted from fairly extensively, or described at least extensively. Mm -hmm. But it's always been a book. I just found it fascinating when I first read it. I first read it in uh, the ancient translation by A.E. Waite, which is kind of an update of the... Uh, 17th century translation. Mm -hmm. And even in that kind of fusty or roundabout kind of translation, it was just <laughs> fascinating to me. And I later read other translations or looked into other translations and didn't find any of them to be satisfactory. Because what I had discovered about it was that it's not this awesome occult adventure kind of magical contemplative book at all. It's a, it's a in my view, a story. And it's a really interesting and even funny story, full of real people and adventures that are, are as comical as they are uh, serious. And I uh, wanted to make it available uh, mm -hmm. to a wider readership in the way that certain kinds of old books can suddenly catch modern attention. There's a, there's a new translation uh, out of the, the Secret Commonwealth, which is a book about fair. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah. a Scott. Scott's guy. Do you know his name? I can't remember it now. Robert, Robert Kirk. Robert, Robert Kirk. Kirk. Right. That was, and that book he, came he, out recently in a beautiful little edition. It was about a small book and uh, beautifully printed and, and put together. And you used to see it up next to the cash registers in, uh, in bookstores. I thought, ah, oh, that's what I'd like. I would like a pretty little book. That, you, know, you, could, you know, people would say, what the heck is this? You know, <laughs> next it up. Uh, that hasn't quite happened. It's uh, it's a little bigger than that, for one thing. But it's a beautiful, beautiful book, and I'm enormously proud of it. And I think that Small Beer Press, who, who published it, both a mm -hmm. deluxe kind of limited edition and a paperback that's also very pretty, very proud of the book. I, I think it's one of the nicest books of my work that I've ever had. Well, I, I'm delighted that you rescued something from Arthur Edward Waite. <laughs> Great old man. <laughs> I mean, absolutely, but oh man, um, not. I, I hope that his his sense of prose style never comes back into fashion. <laughs> no, I, I think there's very little, except for the lovers of H.P. Lovecraft and others who actually are <clears throat> alive as best they can. Well, no, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, Love Lovecraft's prose. I, I don't know. I, I I'm actually kind of a fan of Lovecraft's prose, although it. It's, it's best taken in small doses, like you know some of the, some of the weirder liqueurs. But Lovecraft at least was interesting in his choice of adjectives. Well, I I could never read Lovecraft. Uh, the few <laughs> times that I tried, I couldn't get very far into it. And uh, it's it's not only the sort of book I don't read; it's the sort of prose I don't like, and the sort of person I don't like. <laughs> All of those combined that. made it you know, a little harder. But the other the other guy. Um, who was his friend and wrote very similar stuff. Are you thinking of, Clark, Ash Clark Ashton Smith? Yeah, Clark Ashton or? Smith. I read a little of his stuff, which I thought was pretty funny and interesting mm -hmm. and better written than, than Lovecraft's. Mm -hmm. No but argument there. All of it is not a, not a realm of the, of the literature I've spent a lot of time in. Let's transition a little bit into Ka now. This okay. is your latest novel, John, and uh, we might talk about later it might be your last, but this book on the surface is about a talking crow named Dar Oakley, and we're just curious what your experience was with stories featuring talking animals, and how did those influence this story? Well, that's a good question. Yes, my experiences with talking crows go back to my first reading experiences. I, when I was eight, nine, ten years old, I would go to the public library where in the children's department there was a uh, this enormous row of little books, all by Thornton Burgess, who wrote dozens and dozens of books about animals. And they talked, and they talked to one another, but they also, their behavior was actually, I mean, he was kind of committed to teaching kids about how animals actually lived. And many of the books, almost all of them, were about animal behavior. How they there's one long one I remember where Buster Bear has is doing something funny and nobody can figure out what it is. And one animal talks to another about what is Buster Bear doing piling up all that brush up in the up in the rocks there. And we finally figure out what Buster Bear is doing over the course of the book is he's building a place to hibernate for the winter. He's not gonna come out until it's over. So that was my first real pile of literature and, uh, that uh, had to do with animals talking to each other. 
then, of course, there's books like Wind in the Willows, which is which is reading that uh, was one of my great reading experiences. And um, I never read Water. I did read Watership Down. Now that I think of it, I sort of didn't like it, so maybe I tried to forget. Mm-hmm. But I think I don't know if that actually how much that actually. I think it must have had a huge impact on my trying to think of a book to write about talking birds because that's all I had for a very long time. I thought I'd like to write a book about crows, a bunch of crows in the city, sort of like, you know, sort of bandit gang or, you know, a bunch of pirates. But that's all I had. I didn't have anything more than that. And it wasn't until a larger vision arose of what I might be able to do with a talking crow or a crow who talks to human beings, as well as to other crows, occurred to me, or I allowed it to get built inside me to the point where I could I could take it on. Mm-hmm. I figured that Thornton Burgess had some kind of significant role in your early reading from some of the, some of the details in Little Big. Oh, yeah. Well, think, there's I a whole you... sequence in Little Big, which is basically a parody or imitation of Thornton Burgess. It's an homage. An homage is exactly the word. I was a little nervous when I first came out that I might get sued for copyright infringement. But I later learned that his uh, grandson of his, uh, he lived in Massachusetts. In fact, his home was just down the road from me in Springfield where his farm mm-hmm. was. Uh, oh, okay. I heard from, from a grandson of his that he thought granddad would be very pleased with what I had done. <laughs> I, I, I'm, very, I'm very glad to hear that. Because, yes, yeah, I was uh, glad to hear just, it. But yeah, all the, the the material that you put into John Storm Drinkwater's stories, I was going, yes. I recognize this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Well, John, this novel, Ka, is sort of a return to the fantasy genre for you because your last few novels were more literary. Why did you want to come back to this genre specifically? Well, there was a really practical reason, and that is that the books that I had written in the last decade or so, the, the three that you mentioned, which are, were not fantasy novels, they didn't do so well. They didn't sell very many copies. For one yeah, thing, the fantasy readers didn't particularly care for them. They didn't take to them, even though I thought they had elements in them that uh, would appeal. Actually, the translator, the first of that series of non-genre novels, is a Gnostic fantasy. And if uh, <laughs> it was just a little too subtle for most people, even, <laughs> even within the genre, much less outside the genre, they didn't get it at all. But and even mm-hmm. inside the genre, it wasn't received in that way. <clears throat> so I felt that the genre audience that I had cultivated for so many years, kind of not mm-hmm. really, you know, highly consciously, I, I'm not the kind of writer that tailors works to specific audiences, but I was writing in that kind of mode, there's no doubt about it. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to see if I can't recapture that audience. Uh, and as you hinted, I don't think I've got a lot more uh, writing in me. Uh, I'm going to be 75 next week. So I thought I would like to write another book that would draw that audience back and maybe be fun to write. I had been wondering about the, the sort of your sort of veer away from, shall we say, overt fantasy. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I mean, Peter Straub was a close friend of mine, keeps insisting that my books really are fantasies. <laughs> It mm-hmm. should appeal to this crowd. Even a book, a little novella, like The Girlhood of Shakespeare's Heroines, which is one of the mm-hmm. little pieces that I'm I'm very proud of. And uh, he wanted to get it included into a con- an issue of Conjunctions Magazine, which was supposed to be about the new weird. Mm-hmm. I tried to tell him, no, no, it's just a realistic little story. <laughs> it's not, it's nothing <laughs> No, 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 I connect. I see some very uh, iffy kind mm-hmm. of trans uh, genre things in there. So, okay, mm-hmm. I'm glad you have you publish it. That's, uh, I have no, problem, no objection to that at all. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but they, the, I mean, the others were each of them. If we're talking about three books here, which I wrote, which are not actually, you know, could not be subsumed under a genre definition. The translate was the first, which I say is, you know, sort of not too hard to find out that it's a kind of Gnostic fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, then there was Lord Byron's novel, which at to- least mm-hmm. it told a, a story, a Gothic story, mm-hmm. that did not contain any actual overt, fantastic, ghostly elements, because none of Byron's works ever do. I mean, he's just not into that stuff. So his novel, which I pretended he had written, didn't either. But it was a, at least Gothic. It was an adventure story, certainly. Mm-hmm. And the third... Four Freedoms, which was about building a bomber in the Second World War, which would seem to have no uh, fantasy content at all. In fact, 
the bomber that they are building is completely imaginary and my own invention. And so is the uh, bomber plant in which it's built mm -hmm. in Ponca City, Oklahoma, where there was no bomber. And uh, so it, it, mm -hmm. it's imaginary. I mean, in the in some ways, the the bomber that I built, the Pox, has an analog in the in the B thirty six, which was called mm -hmm. a Peacemaker. And I didn't know that actually until I invented <laughs> my own. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it has a it has a fantasy element. And if you get all the way to the last page. You find mm -hmm. out that I might have a, a, a fantasy core that is kind of a little unexpected. You have to pay mm -hmm. attention, but it's there. Trouble mm -hmm. at all, but you have to pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> but but trying, to, trying to get readers to pay that kind of attention. Uh -huh. and, yeah. It would be nice. <laughs> and, so, and I don't know how it is. But, I mean, there are, there, are, there are writers who earn that kind of attention. I think one of mm -hmm. the difficulties in writing genre is that genre readers will pay intense attention mm -hmm. but not necessarily to literary matters or submerged mm, no. matters or rhetorical matters or linguistic matters they will pay mm -hmm. intense attention to content and mm -hmm. stories old there's no doubt about that but but not so much to style and, and everything right. else that goes with it right. yeah that's true enough John, I, I said on the surface that, you know, Ka was about the talking crow, but I think below the surface, it's really about an old man dying. And as you look back on 40 plus years of fiction writing, and you just said you're about to turn 75, I mean, and with the crow symbolism, which we can talk about, you know, it's a death bird. This theme of death is just pervasive throughout the entire novel. Is this story in any way a reflection of your own mortality? Yeah, of course it is a reflection of my own mortality, though I am in no way as focused on my mortality as the character in my book is. I can occasionally feel, as he does, that the world I live in now has drifted so far from the world I started out in that I don't recognize it, and I don't think mm -hmm. it's as good a world. But a lot of people feel that way. But I don't feel, as he does, that I am entirely done with life in any way, and I have a horror of suicide. I don't... I, I, Kind of, if I ever were to find myself in a situation where suicide would be preferable to life, I don't know if I could manage it. So no, I I, I couldn't do that. I I am a generally more cheerful person than he seems to be. But there's no doubt that we're connected in, in important ways for sure. Well, uh, JMG has authored several books on the future. And this might be a good way. Uh, I know, JMG, you wanted to ask a question about John's I, vision of I, I, the future. It's probably a good time to do that. Th th this, this is something that I've actually been brooding over since about the... No, it will have been when, about the time I read um, Little Big for the first time. Because I noticed at that point that at least in your earlier novels, leaving out the deep, of course, as, as other world fantasy, there were, to some extent, it's almost as though they fit in a common vision of the future. Well, you could almost, I could almost say, the events of Beasts as having happened a generation or two after the events of Little Big and the events of Engine Summer happening, you know, um, some hundreds of years after in this same future arc of decline <laughs> and the disintegration of industrial society. And, and since that's actually been something that, um, full, full disclosure here, one of the things that I've written about extensively is the the way that the, the working of historical cycles and the likelihood that we're not facing the kind of Star Trek future metastasizing across the galaxy or the kind of instant overnight splat that is the, the only other option most people will consider, but a future of decline, rather uncomfortably like the one that, you, that you've actually sketched out in some ways in these novels. I'm wondering, where did that come from? And is it actually, you know, is there a shared a sort of common vision of the future or different variants on that common vision that has shaped your fiction in this way? Well, it's hard to, hard to think that it's not. I mean, you're right that, that I don't perceive disasters. I perceive declines. A little book came out from PM Press, great old left-wing press. They're, right, they're doing a series of books containing material and an interview with various fantasy science fiction writers, and I'm one of them. <laughs> and in that, uh, in my... Uh, one, there was a reprint of an essay of mine called Totalitopia, in which... I yeah, want that. <laughs> totalitarian <Go ahead>. utopia scheme. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't take up most of the essay, but part of the a long essay that is included in that book is about how, in my vision of things, it's, almost, it's impossible to predict the future in any exact or, or um, 
certain way, but you will do better if you simply take the assumptions about the future that are presently in existence and just reverse them. You will get a better huh. okay. uh, look at the future okay. if you do it that way. I thought of this idea back in the 1960s at that time. I said, all right, I'm just going to reverse all of these things. I'm going to reverse. There's not going to be a huge population bomb that's going to burden the earth with millions of people like in, you know, Soylent Green. Uh, mm-hmm. There's not going to be a um, <clears throat> worldwide futuristic, you know, mechanization of everything and uh, robots mm-hmm. in the world and computers. That's not going to happen either. And I just, one by one, just reversed all of these things. Instead mm-hmm. of lots of people, almost no people. Instead of all these things finally added up to the future that's pictured in Engine Summer. It's basically a reverse. Mm-hmm. Well, that's hundreds okay. of years from now, so there's no way I can check it in. <laughs> but I did, you know, I mean, things that I that could have been permanent parts of the future as they were seen in 1968 or so didn't mm-hmm. turn out to be permanent. Mm-hmm. The future, because now we know, because now it is the future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's okay. the same thing with, with trying to predict the future now. I mean... I presented in in this little essay, Totalitopia, a picture of the of the of the world that's going to turn out okay. Universal mm-hmm. anarcho syndicalism, universal um, libertarian socialism, going to take mm-hmm. over the world. Uh, it's going to be run by this syndic of uh, counselors that live all around the world, connect themselves by digital means, and mm-hmm. uh, talk and make choices and decisions. And everybody everybody has a vote. Everybody can vote all the time on all issues mm-hmm. because everybody's connected. So it's easy. Mm-hmm. And there's a command economy. That didn't work mm-hmm. in the, when the Russians tried it because they weren't advanced enough. But if you've got Amazon 4.5, by that time, you will be able to have a command economy and everybody will get what they want within limits. You know, everything will be tailored to you because it can be. 3D printers and, and all that kind of stuff, it can be. Mm-hmm. When I first published this essay, it was published in Lapham's Quarterly in their, their edition about the future. And Lewis Lapham, the editor, was told to me by his assistant, he was talking to his assistant about what I'd read, what I'd written, and he said, does he believe this? <laughs> <laughs> and I had to tell the editor who talked to me, he said, well, uh, what does believing in it even mean? I don't know that I do believe it, but I, is that really relevant? <laughs> I don't know how I believe it. <laughs> it's a vision. Like, engine summer. I don't believe in that either. But, you know, it's, it's, it's as though you're writing not a future of the, history, of the world in these books that you're saying are somehow connected to one another. But think of it, you might think of them more as like movements in the symphony. Mm-hmm. You have a big opening blast and then you have a quiet largo that goes on for a mm-hmm. while and you have another alle- allegro at the end that brings things to a conclusion all of them changing keys as you go along until you end up in the same key which you started to me the writing of books even though it has to contain human material it has to contain human stories and it has to contain thoughts about life and the world and time and history at bottom to me it is kind of musical it, it, mm-hmm. it most important thing to me is the rhythms by which it lives and the, well, the rhythms that can be can be experienced in the reading more than anything else so yeah i think i think it's great the idea that they're all connected and they all tell one big long story but they don't tell one big long story that i believe in and, and <laughs> in the sense that okay. i promote a vision of the of the future evolution of mankind i would never i would never do that mm-hmm. That's been, that's been a question that I've actually been have mulled over for a long time when you're know, rereading, in particular, those early novels and going, wow, you know. Well, I think I think there's one thing that I think that, that a lot of writers must feel, mm-hmm. not all of them, but a lot of writers must feel that they're, all of their books somehow form a, one big opus. I mean, James Joyce has certainly did, yeah. no doubt about that, but lots of other writers do feel that, they're, that their books form one huge mm-hmm. opus. And I had a scheme I was going to write. In fact, I may eventually write it. It was small bits of it have been published as stories about fairies in Ireland in the Tudor settlement. Mm-hmm. And Hugh O'Neill, the great O'Neill, and uh, mm-hmm. Spencer in Ireland, Edmund Spencer in Ireland, writing The Fairy Queen. And in the course of writing that, I thought, oh, and I was thinking about the Egypt stories then, mm-hmm. and Little Big, and John Dee, who was alive in the time of the of the Tudor settlement in in mm-hmm. in London, all those horrible wars they did, uh, he could have influenced you know the wars by his magic abilities and his mm-hmm. angels. So that connects 
this Irish story to mm-hmm. the, the end of the uh, Elizabethan story is the fairies in Ireland getting in their boats and their their mystic fairy boats and leaving Ireland and coming to America where they set up in the woods around this big old architectural oddity in upstate New York. So, <laughs> 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 so there I would have had, you know, 11 or so books all combined into one. That would oh, link to one. I like cool. that. See if somebody can write an essay and wish it could have happened that I did that, but didn't really do it. <laughs> or that it's the secret subtext of even cooler. Mm, I, I can see I can see the doctoral dissertation already. <laughs> hey, uh, John, then, you know, talking about the future, you've spent the last 25 years or so teaching creative writing to students at Yale University. I was wondering how interacting with them and these new generations of writers, how has that informed your view of the future? Wow, that's a good question. Ah, oh, well, yes. I mean, the, the longer I've taught, the older I get and the younger, they stay the same age in projecting their their visions. A lot of them a lot of them who've written fantasy and science fiction with me have not actually tried to predict far distant futures. They, that doesn't seem to be a thing that young people are particularly interested in. Even when I uh, taught a course in Utopia, which I have done a couple of times now, when I first taught it, we read some futuristic utopias, and they didn't seem all that intrigued by them. They would discuss them as, as works of, of writing. But when they wrote their own, they tended to write what Kim Stanley Robinson calls pocket utopias. That is to say, good places that are protected from the outside world by one method uh-huh. or another. And they, uh, good, good societies inside of generally bad or unsuccessful mm-hmm. society. And mm-hmm. in, in one case, in a couple of cases, they described these utopian uh, pocket utopias with a general population of fairly young people. And in one or two instances, at least, their pocket utopia uh, had a built-in ending. It couldn't last forever. It would go out of business after a while. And um, I talked to them about this, and I said, you realize what you've been writing about, right? You're writing about Yale. <laughs> it's a population of young people, and then it's all really wonderful, and it's highly protected, and it's not going to last forever. And they were amazed, I think, a little bit to realize this, and maybe some of them are already thought about. Mm-hmm. Paul Park, who teaches, also teaches a... a uh, Utopia course at Williams College told me that he starts off his class by telling them, boys and girls, or you don't call them that anymore, ladies and gentlemen, you live in a utopia. You you are the you are living in the in the safest, um, richest, most generous, most open liberal society that's ever existed in the history of the world. And you have to start from there if you're gonna write a different kind of utopia. It has to be for others or more general, or something that responds to the fact that you've got it really good. So that's fascinating, because yeah, on the one hand, I can see that, and I've seen pocket utopias of the same kind in, in, a, in a dizzying range of contexts. <laughs> but I'm thinking also, one of the, one of the few utopian writers that, is fair, that, that has had a certain amount of influence in the world, Ernest Collenbach's Ecotopia from the late 1970s, oh, yes. right, which yes. people are still quoting and, and daydreaming about. And it gets its entire its entire literary thrust from this idea that here you have this chunk of North America that is you know that has set itself apart that has cut off all the bad people, <laughs> and it's the yes. story of a of a person from the from from evil New York City who who goes to um, Ecotopia and becomes one of the good people, and it's I mean it's, it, as pocket utopias go, it's a fairly large pocket, but. Even so, there's no idea that this can actually. There, there's no no particular sense that this can actually spread, right? Or right. that this could this could affect. You know, it's just it's just the, the a sort of glorification. Uh, you know, great, the the greater Sausalito co prosperity sphere. <laughs> uh, and I I wondered about that. I actually a little a couple of years ago I wrote I wrote a I don't know semi utopia semi counterblast utopia called Retrotopia. And one of the things that I was specifically doing in there was echoing his, you know, bringing somebody from, from outside into this, you know, the, the standard utopian setting, but doing it in a way that was not so fixated on, you know, we're the good people, everyone else, you know, can stay outside our borders and, and you know, right. and experience whatever horrors they, right. they, you know, await them. Yes. Well, I think that's what my students are 
tempted to do, though others think it's fairly easy to spread these liberal ideas of kindness and safety and all those kinds of things generally. And uh, then you have to disabuse them of that also. <laughs> uh, it's even if they want to include everybody in a good world, it's not, it's not going to not going to be so easy. It's, 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 it's a really interesting lesson almost more than you learn more about them and they learn more about themselves, I think, in coming mm -hmm. up with these utopias than they do actually about, you know, imagining a perfect society in the future, which is in a certain kind of sense, you know, silly. Mm -hmm. uh, probably because you have no idea what the future is going to bring along and that's going to either help or hurt such an establishment. But you have to recreate human nature in order to fit into mm -hmm. it. I try to explain mm -hmm. to my students that utopias are essentially visions of human nature. Mm -hmm. So that you say, well, really, even though bad societies have corrupted them, human beings are really nice, basically. They're, they're basically able to get along with one another and live happily and share and, and live communally and share their uh, uh, ideas and advances for human happiness. Well, is that really the case? I mean, Bellamy, and uh, looking backwards, certainly assumes that his very sudden uh, revolution is going to happen uh, mm -hmm. because people just say, yeah, it makes sense. Let's do it. You know, try that. There's a scene in Ka that reminded me of the Egypt cycle that may tie in here, you know, if we're talking about utopia versus dystopia, there's a scene where Dar Oakley is telling another character, I forget which one, but they're talking about names, and she tells him that, that everything has two names. And that made me think of essentially the central premise of the Egypt stories, that the world has two histories. I think it's safe to say that, John, you definitely have an interest in this more occult or esoteric history of humanity and then also of each of us as individuals. Does this play into this whole idea of utopia and dystopia? Are these the two names? Are these the two histories of the world here? <laughs> That's a very interesting way to understand it. I think that the, what's going on here is not so much visions of utopia and dystopia as it is possibility of different kinds of stories and how they lie together alongside one another in a text. I don't want to get too uh, semiotic here about it, but that's really, I think that's, that, that's what seems to me to be more interesting. When you, when you do a class in utopia and you read all these absolutely different and contrary visions, if you read a story like We, I, uh, Zamyatin, I'm sure you know that. Yeah, Zamyatin, yeah. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. It is the most beautiful book you've ever read. I mean, it is, it's a dystopia that is so out, right up to the end, cheerful and positive and, and hopeful. And when you apply those terms to dystopia, it's as though two stories of the same one place can exist in the mm -hmm. same time frame, especially because of the language in which it's cast. And I think that's kind of the way that, I mean, Dar Oakley is living in a world where he understands human stories. But at the same time, he's a crow, and he has a crow destiny and a crow history. And he can partake in both. He can live in both realms sometimes, sometimes successfully, sometimes failing. Uh, but he does live in both, and he gets the idea or grows into the notion that both of these stories are world-making stories, and yet they, and they interpenetrate. They don't exist by themselves. They can't. Stories of that kind especially all human stories, can't exist by themselves. They all interpenetrate and carry on themes from one to the other. Uh, it's almost like you might say germinate backwards so that mm -hmm. new stories about the past get, get uh, created as we go forward. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's one of the, I think that's really hits on, I think a major theme in my, in my, uh, in all of my writing is that is, mm -hmm. th is this contrary sense of, stories generating other stories and working their way backwards and changing, you know, as they move forward. I was very struck by the way that you had essentially the two world worlds, uh, Ka, the world of crows, and I'm going to mispronounce this probably. How, how do you pronounce Yimmer? I, I pronounce it Ymer. But I don't Ymer. know how it's okay. pronounced. It's a, it's a made-up word. This is a crow word. I don't know how they pronounce it. It's a crow word. How would they? Yeah. Ymer. Okay. <laughs> I have no but idea. How, the one thing these, about crows is that, you know, you can hear them talking, you can, but they're all, they, mm -hmm. all, all you hear is them yelling at each other. You know, what they actually whisper to each other, we don't hear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I like that. But the way that you had the, in, in a sense, in a sense, the two worlds constituted each other, and yes. it was when it was in contact with Immer that that Dar Oakley and and then other crows came to see themselves as a world. Yes, as exactly. a world distinct. That which which yes. struck me that 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 just struck me as something. Okay, this is one I'm going to want to think about for a while. Yes, well, I think they you hit on something very uh, very central to the book, and mm-hmm. the first way that it comes up. Are the first there's a couple of ways that it comes up early on, and one is when the mm-hmm. hierarchy finds out about names and how na- names mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. exist and how you get one of your own. And I'm mm-hmm. sure you noticed in reading that both of you probably noticed in the course of the book that certain names that crows mm-hmm. give to themselves in the first parts of the book turn out to be the names of crows generations, thousands of generations later. And mm-hmm. but now they've been. Just as it, as the as the description states it, they've been worn away over time. Yeah. Names. Well, that's just the way human names work too. Yeah. You know, they, they start off as tribal names or names of stuff you did or whatever, and then mm-hmm. become just you know. I mean, not not most of those people named Fisher don't fish, but uh, yeah. still have those names. And mm-hmm. that so that is one entrance that the crows make into the into the human world, which changes their own world. And the other way is to understand this this thing that humans have this idea that even when they're dead, they're still alive. They're still around mm-hmm. some sense, mm-hmm. in some other sense. And even though they can never actually believe that, Dar Oakley convinces them it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. We can profit from their belief. <laughs> I loved that. And I loved that. And of course, that whole they're thing, not. Yeah. It's ridiculous to believe that you can live on after you're dead. And of course, it's absurd to say that you know we can go to these special places where their realm, they're the realm. Mm-hmm. That you can go to a separate human realm. But that's absurd. It doesn't matter. They, we can still live on their givings, their leavings, mm-hmm. uh, and if we don't believe in it. The funny thing is, though, as he say to himself, is that he has been there. <laughs> he did go <laughs> there. He knows there is such a realm. So, yes, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing that I think is the – and it's the same thing in Egypt, in the Egypt stories, where this constant mm-hmm. back and forth thing about which realm you're in, where, where it is mm-hmm. – where, when are you in the – in the realm of returning magic, when are you in the realm of departing magic? When are you in a realm which is just this just ordinary human reality without that kind of mm-hmm. thing? Mm-hmm. And that's the stuff that I enjoy most about working in fiction because it's all written. It's easy to put those things together. I mean, it's easy. Uh, it can seem <laughs> conceptually it's easy, but it's not easy mm-hmm. to really do, as I have found. You know, I want to make it look easy at the end, but you know, mm-hmm. it isn't easy. But, but- but the actual the actual work of doing it is is not easy, and the more complicated you get with it, mm-hmm. the harder it is to do. I think the hardest book I ever wrote was Demonomania, which is the third book of the Egypt, the third of the just because mm-hmm. many of these trends and and ways of being in the world are intersecting and causing stuff to happen and and turning out to be impossible in the realm that they I just asserted they did happen. I was very afraid that I was I had you know and classically bitten off more than I could chew. I mean, I tell my students that's one of the things you have to do as a writer: bite off more than you can chew, and then figure out a way to do it. I okay. think I did in the end, and even though it might not be my, it's far, very far from being my best liked book. Mm-hmm. It's the one I'm proudest of in that ex, to that extent. I actually, <laughs> I actually mm-hmm. brought it to a successful conclusion. I just have two more quick questions here, and you can both chime in on them. They're very basic, but the first one, John, is. Does a story choose its author? <laughs> That's a good one. I, I it does, I think, but I think that I think that it does. I think that there are now. Let's be clear. There are several. There are many, many writers in the world who are mechanics. I mean, they go out and find stories that they think are going to sell, and they hammer them into kind of texts and and are successful in selling them. And some of them are readable and fun. So I don't think it's every writer is found by the story that he is meant to tell or want, can tell. But I think that it's true, but there have to be, what what would you call them? Harbingers or prophecies or secret messengers who come to you with the stuff that will become the book that you want to tell, that become the story that you want to tell, or reveal to yourself that the story that they are signaling to you is the one inside of you that you are able to tell. I well, I loved Byron from high from high school. 
and in college and after college uh, when I you know when bought all 12 volumes of his uh, diaries and letters and I came to love Byron I never really liked Byron's poetry all that much but I did love Byron and all of that loving Byron kind of came around to saying you want to do this. Byron should have written a novel. He should have written much better than his poetry. It would certainly be able to be read more easily now. Mm. Write it. So, I mean, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Yes, the story was was in me and asking to be told, but I was getting the hints that it was a possible story to tell all along for years mm-hmm. without ever recognizing that, or until it, finally I did recognize Oh, that's what you could do. You could write that novel that Byron never did. JMG, mm. do you have a thought on that? Yeah, and it's actually been it, it, it's interesting you would you would ask that question. I, I mentioned earlier in our show that um, most of what I write is nonfiction. I've actually been writing some fiction over the last few years, and uh, you know, publishing it with some, with well small publishers. But in each case, the novels that that launched that the, the I'd say three of them, it was almost a matter of having things downloaded. I'd be wrestling with some ideas and some, in, in, in the case of the first one, Stars Reach, my, um, you know, uh, post, my, my de-industrial science fiction novel, you know, I, I was working with some ideas in a purely nonfiction sense and I was thinking, okay, how could, how would this work out in the, in the actual future? Okay, we're not going to the stars. We're having to deal with all the consequences of our current stupidities in, in dealing with the planet, da 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 da. And, and yet it's not apocalypse. It, mm-hmm. you know, it's this, mm-hmm. it's this, this ordinary trajectory of, it's the way history actually works in yes. process. Right. And so pretty much over a period of a couple of weeks, I was in a situation where I, I, I started writing this, this, this guy's memoirs and, or, um, it was, fr- frankly, it was much more like sitting in a bar over <laughs> a couple of beers while this guy who was the, you know, the equivalent of a construction worker, except what he does is take apart ruined skyscrapers to get their metal. He's a ruin man. Uh, and, and, you know, he was basically just talking. And uh, so I, that, that one, that one originally was published as a series of blog posts, one a month for, for something like four years. And finally, you know, of course it was published in, in between the covers with a little bit of editing, but that was, I, I mean, yes, there had been a lot of material that of course I've been you know, researching and studying and writing about the future of industrial society for all this while. I was not expecting it to turn into a novel. Right. And and then, what you the, the novel that you that you ended up getting was a novel spoken to you by somebody else. Yeah, it's it's entirely it's entirely first person. Well, it's that's first that's person. one of the, that's that's one of the, that's one of the delivery systems that writers can be can turn out to be very surprised by. Now, yeah, a lot of writers who write every single book exactly the same way, limited, distributed, third person. You know, it's fine. Mm-hmm. The last six novels, I'll write my other next novel that was the same way too. But that's not the way my novels have been written. They're, they're, they tend to have very different storytelling structures in them. Mm-hmm. And that is the thing that it's, it's hardest to wait for in a certain sense. I mean, I had, mm-hmm. had the idea to write Little Big for, for quite a while. I mean, not in, the, not in the form that it eventually took, but the idea of writing a long, fan, long novel, first of all, uh, not a short one like my early uh, novels were. Uh, but a long mm-hmm. one, and I wanted to write a novel about a, a family over generations, a family chronicle novel, like Trollope. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had no idea how to begin it. I, I just, I was stuck with, with this thing. This message had been given, yes, write this book. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but no information about how, no instruction manual was provided. And I didn't want to write it in that. When I started thinking about, you know, the standard distributed, limited third person, I just, I got this awful sense of boredom. I just couldn't face it Mm -hmm. until one day, and I can't remember how, this probably came from, you know, my soul or the air or God or whatever. I said, oh, I don't have to do that. I can just tell the reader a story. Now, why it would take so long to get this idea that that's how you would tell a story like this? I don't know, because of course, you've all read I was old like that, mostly old, but, you know, many, many of them, you know, once upon a time, there was this, mm-hmm. this, this happened, dear reader, and mm-hmm. go on like that for a thousand pages. And then the funny thing is, I hadn't thought of it. And as soon as I did, I said, oh, that's what I do. I just tell a story. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you begin on that, telling a story, and I'm sure this is probably the way Dickens learned to write his, you know, his novels that evolved into his later style. Is you start that way, 
with this jabbering away at the reader and that kind of narrative style. And then gradually you find yourself looking into people's minds and telling what they're thinking and then be, sort of becoming them for pages at a time and indirect mm -hmm. discourse and all that. And then back out again and you can say, yes, well, that's what he thought at the time, but little did he know that. And suddenly you're back out and you're being a narrator again. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I had my my method mm -hmm. and, and I could start start writing. It doesn't mean it was easy, but at least I had no. given a mode in the same way that you've been given a mode by sitting there and listening to your, your guy in the bar. You say, oh, this, mm -hmm. I can do this. I just have to yeah. write what he says, even though he's not reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. he, may not, he may not have been real, but for, for four <laughs> years, he was, he was practically okay, a good friend. Know. That's that was exactly. that was one of the very few books where I was sad to see it end because not, <laughs> not only not only Trace on a Gwen but the whole the, the whole cast of characters had basically become friends by that time, and that was yeah. just one of those things. More recently, I've been doing some things that are actually we mentioned Lovecraft. These are standing Lovecraft on his head. I've always been a great fan of the monsters. Nobody cares about the protagonist. And so this is the other side of the story. But here again, it was a matter of having had this not first person, just having the idea of this particular story, these particular events going clonk and you're you know, the kind of thing where you know you're not going to be able to get this thing out of your head without writing it down. And in this particular case, I ended up writing the first draft of a 70,000 word novel in eight weeks. I have never done anything like that before. It was just this sort of frantic process of getting it onto well onto electrons and and that was that was um third person but third person very close focus entirely through mm -hmm. the um, the eyes of the viewpoint character and here again it was a particular mode of as you know as you were saying a, a particular mode of expressing that kind of mm -hmm. um well it, it has to match story. if it doesn't if it's not going to match the kind of story that you're writing you're writing I, a lot of the students that i that i teach start writing their story in third person and then decide, mm -hmm. no, they like first person better. So they go back and change all the pronouns. And the t oh, and no, 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 no. <laughs> it's just impossible to do that. And they soon learn. <laughs> as soon as they start to try it. But these are two different, uh, entirely different modes of, of, of expression. And they, it does, doesn't depend on uh, the pronouns. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that they... That, but in the, and even when they do hit upon storytelling mode, the raconteur mm -hmm. kind of mode, you know, where you say, this happened to this guy and he didn't like it. And so, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but anyway, the next thing that happened was, and that hit on that kind of mode. And then they think they've done something wrong. They bring it into class and, and they'll even get criticism. You know, You're telling mm -hmm. and not showing. I have to go through the whole explanation that, you know, there is nothing in written stories that is not telling. <laughs> it's all telling. <laughs> but I, it just depends on how, which way you want to tell it. Telling and showing. Fuck. <laughs> Yeah, so having taught young people for the last couple of decades, John, is there a is there a correct right way to tell a story? Is there a certain structure that you teach to them or do you just sort of give them a rough map of the terrain? How do you teach young people how to tell stories and through that process, have you seen that have we forgotten how to tell stories as these generations have been raised? I wonder about that and I mean my my own practice is I never tell students what what to write. I mean, you know, what I think is good writing or what I think is good, good kind of story to tell. That's I, entirely up to them. All I want to do is say, look, over the history of written fiction, a lot of different uh, methods and tricks have been uh, have been evolved and have been described by critics and so on. And you might not think that they're fun to read or whatever, but here's a bunch of them that I know about. And uh, so you talk about, and I even give them names. In fact, in some of my fiction writing classes in the past, I even give them a final test. You know, identify all these names, you know, uh, Peripatia and uh, Synecdoche and stuff like that, which they are supposed to <laughs> learn in the course of, of the class. And I'm basically, what I'm trying to do is give them tools for writing and to look in stories for where these tools and how these tools have been deployed in the past by other writers so that they can do the th so they can use it themselves and these are tools for making sentences tools for making paragraphs tools for making whole stories that have beginnings middles and ends and that's basically what i what i try to do D have i encountered that things are slipping farther and farther away from that i think i am in a way i think that students are um, coming into classes not having sort of ingested all of that stuff from childhood the way I did. 
and people of my age did because you read so many stories that had certain kinds of shapes and you came to recognize them and you said, and then there's others which had different kinds of shapes and you started to be able to see it in a kind of instinctual way and then you could learn about it in school and they taught, they went on and on about stuff like that in both high school and in college when I was going to them. And um, I don't think that my, my daughters, who are now 30, did learn that. And I don't think that my students really do it too. In a certain sense, they have to invent it all over again, all for themselves, which makes it very hard to, you have to start in some, even the most talented ones who have an instinctive sense of telling stories and an instinctive, they have great talent and they're doing beautiful work and they're describing odd things that I've never thought of. They still often don't have a grasp of, of how things are going to play out and how the rhythm of a story is is built. And so you have to kind of back them up a little bit, say, well, now you've got this. I don't know if it just came right out of your heart onto the page, but now step back and let's see if we can make this work for a, a, a reader. JMG, do you have any thought on that? I've, I've fortunately never had the um, task of trying to teach anyone else to write. I say fortunately simply because I, I, I would have no clue how to do it. <laughs> um, well, neither did I when I started, so... Yeah, well, you know, growing up in uh, a couple of generations, you know, a good a good twenty years um, after you, um, because I'm fifty five this year, I've, I've very much had the had the sort of intermediate experience where the literature of any, of any particular quality was sliding out of the school and um, be re- relevance. Everything had to be relevant, meaning it had to be. We had to erase the past and. Right. It was. It was mostly. It was, I, I was profoundly bored through most right. of my school. Yes. And so, you know, to the extent that I have any sense of of some of these, you know, so, some of these more interesting patterns of ways of storytelling, you know, it's purely as an audited act, purely as a matter of of reading stuff at random as I stumbled across it, and. Mm-hmm. Other than trying to say, okay, go read a lot of stuff that was written before you were born, <laughs> I, I really don't know how I would how I would uh, offer no. people any kind of instruction. It, it's a puzzle. I'm not sure that I ever conquered it. And of course, as the more you teach it, the more you think maybe it's not possible to teach people how to write. Mm-hmm. They're either going to they're either going to get it or, or or not. So yeah, but I think that one of my the one thing that I am clear about with them is that I am uninterested in stories in which cruelty is revealed to be something that we ought to be able to avoid or that there are the that the point of a story is what is lenin's uh, who whom who did what to whom and who suffered mm-hmm. because of other people's actions especially in the social realm and especially between men and women and between races and stuff like that i'm just i too many stories are too easy to write in that mode because it's all set up mm-hmm. for you to start and all you have to do as you said when you were going on as my daughters when they were growing up I can't tell you how many stories they read about concentration camps. Yeah. You know, it seemed like such an easy give. Here we're going to have a story of a kid who goes in and his parents die, and but the kid survives, and somehow he's okay afterwards, or at least has a life. There were dozens of them, and I said, my wife and I both complained about this. Why, why is this the story? And if that's mm-hmm. not the story, it's Native Americans being uh, exterminated mm-hmm. by white uh, invaders. It just to come up with a, a moral distinction like that gets you nowhere toward writing anything worth reading. It's certainly a distinction worth having in your mind and in your heart mm-hmm. between good and bad. There's no doubt about that. But that, that has next to nothing to do with writing or mm-hmm. making good mm-hmm. writing. How important to you both, and uh, John, I'll just, I'll just stick with you for a moment. How important is the art of storytelling to the survival of humanity, to our future, you know, just to sort of bring this whole thing full circle here. How important is storytelling to the future of our race and the future of our world? Wow. Well, if I knew that, (laughs) I could tell you. But here's the thing. I don't think storytelling is ever going to stop. I think that storytelling is going to be important to the future of our world because we are never going to stop telling stories. We have minds that cannot do anything else. I mean... There is no way, uh, unless we hand it all over to AI, which doesn't tell stories and doesn't know how stories are and doesn't mistake the world for a story and it doesn't do that kind of stuff like we do, we will go on telling stories that are only partially true. I mean, one of the most amazing things about the Internet and, and listening to people 
brood, thousands and thousands of people brooding over the same stories, how many different kinds of stories you can tell about the same single little incident and how often the meaning changes. And it changes. It's more the moral tenor of it changes. The actual facts change. The, the time frame in which it's supposed to happen changes. All of these things are happening and they're sort of fighting it out all at once. We're fighting it out in a way that we never did before because the stories are more fixed. If you got them in the newspaper, if you got them in books and magazines, they didn't change overnight. They didn't change hour by hour. And now they do. So, yes, stories are going to accompany us into the future and they're going to make part of our being in the world and our changing the world and our making of the world. It's got to. It's got to. There's just no other way we can do it. What I don't understand is how we're going to deal with this idea that cha- that stories change constantly and cannot be fixed and are so easily counterfeited and so easily uh, subverted by people with bad intentions. I just, I have no idea how we're going to get around that, but I know that it's a huge threat. And unless we do get around it, we can't get around it by not telling stories anymore. That's what I'm sure of. But how we are going to get around it by telling stories in a different way or, uh, I don't know, censorship. I don't, I can't even imagine how we're going to get around it. I think that it's going to go on more than it is now into the future. And I don't know where the end of it comes. We can't unplug. doesn't look like anyway. So yes, stories, good stories, better stories, real stories that tell truths. And I don't mean true facts. I mean truths. Hmm. That'll, that will carry us on into the future, we hope, if there is one. Truth. Uh, I don't mean truth. I mean, if there is a future. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I certainly have to agree with John about uh, the, the the necessity of stories. I mean, we think in stories um, about as inevitably as we eat with mouths and walk with feet. Yeah. Um, we we can't we can't do anything without putting it into a story. We're the, we're a storytelling species. You know, for all for all, crows may also be another storytelling species. But we're cert- that's certainly something going on with us. And I think a lot of what's going on nowadays in terms of the stories we tell and the stories as they change and the stories that get spun one way or another, uh, to begin with, it's not a new thing. We went through a period where stories tended to fix themselves fairly easily in, in printed newspapers, in printed form, and that had certain positive things and certain negative things because, of course, many of the stories that got fixed in printed form uh, were just as, just as fake, if you will, and just as distorted oh, yeah. as some of the things you find on the internet these days. But there's a real tendency toward, and I'm going to riff back to something, to something, something, John, something you said a little while ago. There's a real tendency to force stories into a couple of very simplistic patterns. The people who are all good suffering from the people who are all evil right. is one of those stories, and, mm-hmm. and it's not a very good story. No, um, by that I mean it's, it's, a, it's an unproductive story, but it's also a boring story. <laughs> That's right. Well, I think you can characterize bad societies by their tendency to tell the same stories over and over and over again in the same form and be have boring stories. I mean, everybody talked about mm-hmm. this about, has talked about this, especially in, in one of the great examples was uh, Soviet literature from the revolution on through the end of the Soviet Union, in which mm-hmm. official literature was, mm-hmm. everybody thought it was, everybody was, was clear that it was stupid and boring and uh, had been written by hacks who were mm-hmm. following a set of fairly simple rules. And it is a sign of a bad society to have bad, boring stories being told. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't see that around now. I mean, I, there's, there's a huge amount of bad crap going around. There's no doubt about that. There always is. But it's all different kind of crap, at least. It's not the same crap over and over and over again, except for mm-hmm. that certain tendency that's on around now that's in a lot of books, but it's far more in television and films, of there being solely about power. Mm-hmm. This bothers me a lot that mm-hmm. they that it all seems to be about power, you know the mm-hmm. the beheader beheaded the uh, the owner disowned the uh, everybody is like this everybody is uh, subverting everybody else in order to climb to the top of a heap, and people mm-hmm. find the stories riveting even though they don't are almost to you know ninety percent of them aren't engaged in that kind of behavior themselves, but they seem to love watching. Whether it's in Game of Thrones or House of Cards or in novels, science fiction novels seem to be uh, drawn to it far more than they used to be. And it, I, I think that's a kind of boring story that would that would represent a bad thing in society in the same way that boring mm-hmm. propaganda would 
in a totalitarian society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to go back to a different Renaissance Italian name, uh, Giambattista Battisavico used to oh, say that yeah, society started out in one kind of barbarism and it ended up in another kind of barbarism. You start out with the barbarism of sense of sensation and you go through a period of relative culture and then you, you fade out into a kind of barbarism of reflection where uh-huh. um, the mind just the minds just run off in random directions producing you know, eventually the, 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 the recurso, the return along the course the nations run. Right. And sometimes when I, when I watch the, the way discourse in our society has turned not into, not into a totalitarian kind of thing where, where everybody has to, everybody's supposed to mouth the same discourse, but a kind of, a kind of debased jabber where everyone's saying something different in a different language, mm-hmm. nobody's listening, and the languages are so mutually, mutually incomprehensible. Mm-hmm. That you know, it's just it it, it just disintegrates into in, into as I said, jabber. Yes. I think that's considerably closer to the the kind of thing that we seem to be heading into now. And I think one way around that, and just to cycle back to to the question, is simply that we need to become better at storytelling, and we need to become more critical more critical thinkers, better, clearer at understanding stories and looking at stories and saying, oh, I know that story. And that mm-hmm. story is really, really dull. And let's tell a different story. Let's get away from all these stories about the good, about the good people who are only good and the bad people who are only bad. Let's mm-hmm. get out the stories about the finger pointing stories and the, and get to some stories with some complexity and some richness, so we can have more complex and richer lives. Agreed, completely. I think the stories are there. I think that if you poke around and you and you pick up the right books, you can you can still find it. The people are still writing. Oh, yeah. It. It's just that it's okay. hard to find in the in the in the vast mass of, of other stuff. And it might be it might be that you're right. I mean, you know, Vico's story, by the way, is also just a story. <laughs> Remember that? Of course of course. <laughs> of course, yeah. So uh, it's it's a powerful one, but it, it remains just a story. Just oh, like yeah. the crows the crow my crow in, in uh in, in, in my story finally gets tired of human stories and is ready to go uh, away mm-hmm. to he can to find a place where there aren't any stories anymore and there are mm-hmm. stories and he can rest from his adventure within the realm of story, which he fell into by accident in the first place and mm-hmm. never could get out of uh, in one form or another. But he, at the end of the book, I suppose I shouldn't, it's not exactly a spoiler, is it? Because it's talked <laughs> over the first pages of the book, but he does at the end try to give up on the realm of story, whether he's ever going to be successful or not, we don't know. So we mentioned earlier that this might be your your last novel, and I I think that was kind of a good segue into that question. Is this your last (laughs) novel, John? And if it is, why? Well, I have stated that it is my last novel, partly because I'm very old. I mean, I suppose I could write more, but it does get actually increasingly harder. This was not an easy book to write. Well, the previous one was very easy, so maybe I'm misunderstanding or misstating my own capacities. But this one was kind of tough. And uh, I also, for most of my my writing life, uh, my books have begun with an idea or a scheme or a thought that doesn't get written until 10 years later. It doesn't even get started to be put into uh, into story form until 10 years later. Almost all of my books are like that. Even the early science fiction novels had their origins and things that I thought of in high school. Now, I don't have any more of those. I've always had one that's been like, you know, in line (laughs) to come up. And I don't have another. Maybe I will find one. Maybe one will hatch itself. Maybe I'll just sort of put something together. I don't know. And when I told my agent that I was think this is my last book, he said, John, never say that. <laughs> never say that. Especially not in the hearing of your publisher. Don't say that you have no <laughs> So I probably uh, under obligation not to say that anymore. So you can exclude all of these remarks of mine about it being my last book. I don't know. I have a couple of more stories. It may well it may well turn out to be that I am either underestimating myself or overestimating my present act of resignation, I guess you might say. If it is your last novel, it, it, it's a rich original tale that anybody hearing this should go immediately pick up from their local bookseller. JMG, I'm going to give you the last word here to s- sort of summarize this for us. 
I, I, I don't know that I'm going to even try to summarize it. I will um, add to, the, to, to what you just said and encourage our listeners to run, don't walk, to the nearest bookseller. Your nearest full-service bookstore, which will actually pay a decent royalty to the author, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you both. It was a pleasure and an honor. Pleasure was mine. And there you have it. My thanks again to John Crowley and John Michael Greer. Again, what a thoughtful chat it was, I think. Francis Yates, Talking Crows, Creative Writing, Pocket Utopias, The Future of Storytelling, and the Slow Decline of Industrial Society. A perfect companion piece to the holiday season, not only because you could and should absolutely gift yourself or a loved one with John's new and perhaps final novel, Ka, which is linked in the show notes, but also because our rampant consumerism is partly or maybe mostly responsible for creating that rather realistic view of the future of Western society that John and John shared with us. But speaking of gifts, I need to shout out one of the show's many supporters, Mr. Michael Kovacic, or Kovacic, I'm sorry man, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. You know, Mike recently sent in a, uh, a generous holiday gift in an amount that is way too high, and honestly I'd feel a bit embarrassed even sharing it. And he also put a nice little note with it, and, you know, as I just said, it was quite generous. And it's the kind of generosity that's also quite humbling, because it's absolutely unnecessary, and also because it does reinforce to me that, you know, maybe I am doing something right here. I actually told someone the other day that if just one person hears this and takes something positive from it, or has their life impacted in a positive way, then I have accomplished something of great significance. It's not often you have the opportunity to touch people or inspire people, and it doesn't happen often because those are the sorts of opportunities that rarely just come to you. You have to go out and make them, and when you do make them, you better make damn sure you do something with them. I don't know if I've done that, but I do know that those of you who've taken a moment to email me or follow me online or review the show, or support the show, you know, you guys seem to appreciate it, and that's all I can ask for. And of course, if you want to get in on this action, you know, those support options are linked in the show notes, as is a couple links to our Etsy store and our new storefront at allculturepodcast.com slash store, which I just set up over the weekend. Both of those have our first t-shirt available for purchase, so, you know, if you're looking for a last-minute gift idea for yourself, it's there. If you've made your own nice list, that is. Aside from that, I wish those of you celebrating any sort of holiday this month a happy and healthy one, be it Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, Boxing Day, Saturnalia, or the imminent winter solstice. Whatever it is, enjoy it. Stay safe if you're traveling. And remember what this time of year is really about by drying some magic mushrooms in front of the chimney. Well, that's it for this one for me. I'll see you on the other side of Christmas with two more shows before we close the chapter titled 2017. But until then, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.
please rewind this cassette.